I want to introduce Brill Nikoloff, who has been our course instructor for conversation design. And we're hoping that Greg Bennett is also going to be able to join us, but we haven't seen him just yet. And so uh, let's start with Brill and not, and then if uh, Greg manages to get in, we'll be happy to introduce him and include him too. So Brill, talk to us about your career in linguistics and beyond. Okay, uh, and I just pinged Greg on Twitter, so we'll see if he gets in. Right. Um, I think you mentioned he's traveling, but we'll see. Um, my career. So, in a nutshell, I'll start from the very beginning. <laughs> I studied linguistics in college along with uh, pre-med and neuroscience. Um, I came from a very STEM-forward family, so it was always kind of assumed that the better, quote unquote, better paths in life were lawyer, doctor, engineer. Um, so I was kind of like, doctor seems fine, like, I'll go with that. Um, but really, my passion was always learning about language and linguistics. And so I started out with a minor in linguistics in college. By the time I was a senior, I had taken so many classes that I had just racked up all the credits and it had just turned into a major automatically. Um, that's when I realized maybe I should start listening to myself a little bit more um, about what I love to do. And I think my problem in my school was that, you know, the department wasn't really putting on any events like this. Uh, not even close. It, there wasn't really much conversation at all about what kinds of careers you could do beyond academia. So with that, I was graduating and kind of thinking, you know, now's the time I need to schedule my MCAT and get that ball rolling. And I just found myself not doing it. <laughs> days, days went on. Um, so I kind of just had to like really come to terms with what am I actually doing here? And, you know, around that time, Alexa, what, let me mute. Oh, she's already muted. Perfect. She was becoming very, very popular. Uh, that was around the time that Amazon launched Alexa and obviously Google Assistant followed shortly after. Um, so I completely switched gears. I had a friend in design, graphic design. She had studied art in school and I was always like, that's cool, but A, my parents would never approve of me doing something like that. And B, what are you gonna do after school? Like, how are you gonna make a living? But she was doing her own thing and I was like, okay, fine. Turns out she was always the one with the internships that were paying her so much money in college. Um, and then she had a six figure salary when she graduated. And I was like, teach me your ways. Like, what are you doing? How are you doing this? And she was like, well, there's something called design that, you know, you can, like, you could get into this too. There's design for all kinds of stuff, uh, not just graphical inf interfaces, but there's now voice interfaces on Alexa and chatbot interfaces. So I was like, well, you know, I don't, have a super artistic eye, but I really like kind of this idea of design thinking and, and how designers work together and think. And it, I had always been very, very, um, like I just wanted to make things and, and produce stuff and create. So that's really like what design is at its core. Um, and so I just really like dove in and researched and, and tried to do my best to figure out what this field of buoy design is. Um, and I'll, I'll get like weirdly specific just because I don't think like it, it can be hard to kind of visualize someone's actual career path and like every point at like every juncture. So to be perfectly honest, I was like I was in a great position when I graduated because I was a live-in nanny, so I didn't have to worry about making rent um, or moving back home. Um, so 
that put me in a spot where I was working 20 hours a week as a nanny and then had kind of 20 hours to really research, apply for jobs and start like connecting with people on LinkedIn. And that's kind of really like, that was really the key for me is, you know, reaching out to linguists uh, in bigger companies asking, hey, what do you do all day? Like, what is your, what was your career path? Um, because back then, I don't know, it was like four years ago, but really no one was calling themselves a conversation designer just yet. Um, and so it was really a matter of like first finding people in these companies that sort of identified as linguists and then asking them more about who they work with. And that really led me to curate a LinkedIn feed where interesting stuff was popping up. One day something popped up. It was a post from Ahmed Bouzid, who's um, kind of a thought leader in the voice space. And he was asking if anyone was interested in a VUI designer role. Um, basically he framed it as like, if you've never heard of that, but you might be interested in designing voice interfaces, you should reach out to me because again, it was so early. Um, it still is early to be honest uh, in this field. So yeah, and, and again, the reason I wanted to like mention, like it was literally a post that I saw is because I was spending so much time on LinkedIn, finding people, connecting with people. And he was like a connection of a connection. So I never would have seen that if I wasn't really focusing on people versus um, job applications, if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> I messaged him, I was like, hey, I really, I'm really glad you posted about this because I have never heard about this role before. Um, I think it might be perfect for me. And I'm just really excited that you posted it because even if we never get to work together, like I feel like I have a lot of clarity now on like what I could be pursuing. Um, and that really snowballed into kind of like a, an unpaid internship for a couple months and then kind of like a stipend type thing um, after a few months. And then about one year in, it turned into kind of a full-time salaried um, position. And that was my in, I would say, like that's really how everything started. And um, so I was a voice designer at Whitlingo. That was his company um, for two to three years. And then I moved on to Botmock, which is where I'm currently at. I'm not currently doing voice design like day to day, but I can talk a little bit more about my role right now too, if that's interesting a little later. Cool, so um, I was intrigued and I wanna underscore something you said, which is uh, it, it was very early in conversation design. Mm -hmm. And yet I know that there were all kinds of, you know, text-to-speech systems or the reverse speech-to-text systems that were attempting to be as universal as we've got them today, but we're not yes, yet doing that. So did you have any contact with those earlier in incarnations? Um, <clears throat> actually, no, like <laughs> okay. I, uh, all of the veterans in the space and by veterans, I mean people that were generally working on designing interactive voice response systems, like the ones where you call into Kohl's or you call into Delta and you talk to a robot, that, those were really kind of the first super ubiquitous voice interfaces that people that humans were designing um and so i'm sure like most people in that space that have been doing it for 10 15 20 years have a lot more familiarity with the uh the tech behind it like the actual text to speech and the speech to text and um the inner workings but the interesting thing that i think happened just around the time I graduated was that we got to the point where we were no longer working with code, if that makes sense. And we were more working with UIs that your average person can use. So to kind of like draw a parallel to um, just graphic design and um, visual interfaces on your iPhone or on like a website. In the 90s, when websites became, you know, ubiquitous worldwide, the only people that could cr create websites were people that knew how to code. Um, and that was just kind of a function of how the technology came, like, 
you know, how it worked basically. Nowadays, obviously you can use Wix or you can use Squarespace. You can use all these other tools that you don't need to know any coding to be able to use. And they're just a lot more user-friendly. Um, so a very, just a very similar thing happened with voice basically in like the 20 teens where instead of you know it, needing to know a ton about the inner workings and what's really going on and having to know how to code to create these designs, um, tools like Botmuck and others made it possible for your quote unquote non-technical designer to create something just as um, robust as someone who does know how to code. Right, and from that early work in the 90s, you may, may or may not be aware of this study, but a guy named B.J. Fogg and his students at Stanford looked at credibility of websites. And one of the factors that they said that people, that they got from the results of showing a lot of different websites to people, this is, you know, 92, 93 era, probably, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit later than that, maybe as late as 95, um, they, demonstrated that websites that were more attractive in terms of graphic design were more credible than websites that might be from a trusted source like the professor who wrote the textbook on the topic. But it was all text. It wasn't formatted in any way. It didn't have familiar headings and footers. It didn't have some of those uh, visual elements that may gave people confidence, this is a serious website. And so I think you're talking about similar kinds of tools that allowed non-specialists to, to create things out of HTML when they didn't even know how to spell HTML, right? <laughs> okay. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and that's, I mean, that's a great point to bring up. Design is something that businesses invest heavily in because of studies like this, where we know that people aren't gonna trust your brand if the touch points that they um, experience with your mobile app or your website or your IVR or your customer service reps or anything, if it's not well designed, thoughtfully designed, then you're going to lose customers and you'll, you'll lose their trust. So it applies to any, like literally anything that your customers are touching when it comes to your journey. Um, and that now includes voice inter interfaces too. Right, right. So now we've got uh, voices that come, we say things and voices answer us, or we say things and text answer us. And it, you know, it's the Turing test every day, multiple times, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everybody here is familiar with that expression. Uh, everybody knows Alan Turing, uh, who was a computer scientist in the UK during World War II. And his, he said, uh, I'll know that computers are intelligent or whatever his claim was, uh, when I can talk to the computer, whether it's typing or speech, he didn't discriminate. And I can't tell whether it's a human or a machine at the other end because the responses are so appropriate. And so that's sort of been a, if not spoken, then certainly unspoken goal is that we should make the artificial intelligence part of this, the conversational part of this, credible as a human might be. And yet, I'm going to let, <laughs> let you fill in the blank. Far away. No, yeah, we're still so far away. That's why voice designers exist is because, I mean, we may, we all throw around the term AI like, you know, like it's candy, but... <laughs> Right. It, it, AI is, is not really like at a point where we can trust it to perform um, reliably in most scenarios. So we still, that's why we have designers backing these because I mean, some here may have heard of GPT-3. I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. GPT-3, which is basically like an AI speech system that is now um, widely available to be used. It's It uses all these like fancy neural nets and all that fun stuff, but it's still so easy to break it. And so 
you know, brands are not jumping on, you know, instead of having a bunch of designers creating our voice interfaces, let's just hook up GPT-3 and call it a day. Like th there's, that's just not gonna happen um, because you can still say things that are going to cause GPT-3 to respond with something offensive or inappropriate or just not aligned with your brand. Mm. Um, and so we need designers to be always like providing these guide rails, guide posts, guard rails. <laughs> <laughs> Gutters, something like that. Gutters, gutter lids, yeah. <laughs> good, good, okay. So um, I'm gonna jump around a bit because I definitely wanna hear about what you're doing now. And uh, so let's jump to the present and then we can go back and review some more things. And as people are uh, asking questions, we can go ahead and do that. So you're now head of product at Bachmach. What's product for you? Um, what, like, what is the product? Yeah, what's the product? The product is, let's see. Um, I like to explain Botmok as almost like a Figma or a Canva or, you know, Illustrator, but for conversations. So mm -hmm. instead of instead of a visual asset that you're producing, you're producing a conversational asset, and Botmok just makes it easy for literally anyone whether you're technical or not, to map out different conversational paths and then be able to use that design to just shoot it over to a, uh, an NLP platform that you'll be using and then deploy it so that your customers can actually interact with it. And so what kinds of functions do your bots get deployed into? Um, lots of different ones. So if you, if you talk to uh, Delta through WhatsApp, they might use Botmock to design that conversation with that bot. If you talk to um, Alexa or Google Assistant, uh, brands will use something like Botmock to kind of ideate and brainstorm in the early stages of their design phase, um, go through approval processes, comment with their teammates names on okay we need we need to change this prompt it doesn't really sound right this greeting sounds a little bit off it's a bit long you know all of this stuff that we're keeping in mind when we are designing a conversational ui um so really anywhere you can have a conversation with a brand which broadly would be an ivr on a phone or a google assistant or alexa on a, a smart speaker or a chat bot on a visual ui um, that is where you may be interacting with a design that could have been designed on Botmark. Okay, and so uh, I, uh, for people who haven't been in these conversations before, IVR stands for? Interactive voice response for when you're calling into a, uh, you know, a, a toll-free number, for example. Right, and they're trying to route you to the right place. Yes, exactly. Okay. Anyway, yeah. you're not going to be talking to a human right off the bat, and you need a bot to be kind of handling some of that interaction. What I call phone mail jail. I don't, I'm not the one who coined that phrase, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And that, and the reason why we feel that way is because the designs have been so bad in the past. <laughs> so what does a, a linguist bring to this that an ordinary human does not? Yeah, great question. I'm so glad you asked. Um, <laughs> you're waiting for this one. So I, f I find it so interesting because linguists are like, it's almost as if the industry is just now waking up to the realization that linguists like understand language front and backwards, <laughs> like that we know things on an instinctual level about how to um, determine patterns and um, how to think and analyze, for example, a prompt that might be uh, a good thing to say to someone on the phone versus not say whether that's because like phonetically it, it isn't able to be uh well understood by the majority of the population or whether it's um because um the type the vocabulary that you used is too uh formal and it doesn't really uh seem like it should be natural speech. I mean, that's why IVRs for so long feel so robotic. It's a lot of it, I think, is because um, 
it's not super well understood by non-linguists that speech and text are very, very, very different things. <laughs> and so when you write something down, you it, it it we're not intending for it to be spoken aloud most of the time. Um, and so, yeah, like when when we're designing for voice, we are always thinking we're a we're always reading it aloud after we write it down because that is really the best way to be thinking about you know why does that sound off or does it sound too formal? Are we using vocabulary that is too elevated um, for you know? for the target group that we're trying to speak to. How do our users speak? Um, and then, you know, obviously we have all the obvious things that we're thinking about, like what language are we using and what dialect, but it, it gets so much more nuanced than that too. Um, so just the fact that this is our bread and butter and, and words are kind of the currency of voice design or conversation design, um, puts linguists in a in a great position because a we just love thinking about this stuff which which is gonna position you you know from the get-go to to want to just excel at it but b we we know things that non-linguists don't know and and that that can sometimes just really help solve a problem when when something is just not working with a particular design Okay, so you're talking about design a lot, and I have a feeling uh, from, you know, knowing this group a little bit over the last few weeks, that that term is so foreign to them, and they haven't yet uh, thought of it as part of their lives. Okay. So let's, let's try another attack at design. And I'll say the definition that I offered in my session on user research and design was design is rendering intent. And so I'd like you to riff on whether you think that's a useful definition and how it plays out in voice user interfaces. Yeah, I really like that definition. And I'm glad that you called out um, and kind of asked us to backtrack a little bit because in my own course, I okay. really sure. wanted to also backtrack and go to the very, very beginning of how I wish someone would have explained design to me right when I was <laughs> like graduating and had never really heard of it before. Um, so my definition is not going to be as clear cut as yours. I think <laughs> I, it's not my definition. I borrowed from somebody else, but I like <laughs> it. And I think it, it gives good food, you know, food for thought and good discussion. But yeah. yes, go ahead. No, it's a it's a great definition. And it can be applied to, you know, any kind of design. I mean, design can be um, a physical object in the world, like a tea kettle, it could be uh, instructional design, how you present knowledge that you're teaching. It can be obviously like a building, it can be a voice interface. So to me, design is the perfect intersection of uh, like beauty and function, where to me, art can only be like, if art only wants to be beauty, it can just be beauty. Um, if science just wants to be function, it can just be function. But for me, design is kind of like merging those two things together. And, and when you're designing something, you are intending to create something that does something that is functional, but also does something in a way that is ideally really uh, graceful or delightful for whoever is doing said thing. And sometimes the best design disappears. So you don't even realize exactly. there is design there. Exactly, exactly. In fact, right. I would say most of the time, the best designs aren't even necessarily noticed. Right, right. So the most elegant, the most beautiful. I mean, and, and then the other part is automation is the best user interface in some regards, except you've got to choose when to deploy it and when not to deploy it. Yeah, absolutely. So, Speed dialing. I don't know if anybody even thinks about speed dialing anymore because we all have it all the time. Just the way we live, look up the person's name in your address book, poof, touch it and you're on speed dial. We used to have to program that stuff into <laughs> our phones. And before that, then you relied on the operator to speed dial for you. you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> now we have speed dial with uh, with voice, <laughs> like, with hey, voice, hey right. call, call Nancy, you know, exactly. 
I was going to say call Briel. Okay, good. <laughs> We've got the same idea. We're talking. Um, so let's let's go back and uh, to some of these questions that I was uh, proposing last night. Uh, so I understand that you have a bachelor's degree, and it was joint between neuroscience and uh, linguistics. Is that right? Correct. You never went on for master's, and obviously not for a PhD. And do you feel any regrets for that at this point? No, I don't. Actually, I have a fun story about that. When Good. I was having my crisis senior year, <laughs> um, I I actually applied for the. My school had like a an accelerated master's in linguistics program. It's probably okay. fairly common, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I had realized that I had taken a lot, a lot of different grad classes, actually, as an undergrad, my, my department was small enough to where they were like, that's fine. <clears throat> and I just loved them so much. I, I just wanted to like learn everything. So, I, and I, I was also freaked out about what I was going to do after school because I was like, I don't really want to be a doctor. I guess I kind of have to, I don't know. So if I could maybe get into this master's program, A, I'm buying myself some time because I'm just like terrified of what I'm actually going to be doing after this. But B, I know that um, this is something that I love learning about. So I got rejected from that. And then I was like, oh, now what am I supposed to do? <laughs> like that would have been a perfect bridge to like, appease my parents, help myself kind of think a bit more, especially because now I knew a little bit about like, maybe there are other paths for linguists, but, but yeah, I was rejected. And I think I, I'm like, so, so, so grateful that I was rejected because if I hadn't been, I never would have probably found that post on LinkedIn. I probably wouldn't have, you know, thrown myself into networking just like as my full-time job. And, um, and when I did find, when I did connect with Ahmed, who became my boss, that, you know, he was just such a good mentor and that was really, really lucky. But I kind of felt like I was in grad school when I was working for him because, mm -hmm. um, because he, he, it was, it was interesting. Like we almost were able to trade, like he was able to trade really, really good mentorship and teaching in exchange for kind of like a not market level salary, if that makes sense. Um, right. So you took a little bump yeah. down. Yeah. Because you were not yet trained and on the job. Not trained. Yeah. But I'm sure after six months or one year, you got a nice bump back up to what would be market level. Exactly. So yeah, it was kind of a unique situation, but again, I want to like emphasize how how finding people will really, for me, get you further than shooting your resume into portals. Um, mm, mm. My sister just graduated like two weeks ago, and I'm just I keep telling her like we're gonna we're gonna reach out to people on LinkedIn. We're not gonna just submit to a bunch of different portals. Like right. you can do both, but especially in this space, if you find the people, the community is so small. And so everybody kind of knows which companies are hiring and everybody kind of knows each other. So if, you, if you're able to connect with people that, uh, and make them kind of make, help make them an advocate for your own career by keeping in touch with them, um, sharing successes, um, and again, the, I want to say this too, because a lot of times people will reach out to me and say like, Hey, you know, can I have an informational interview with you? And I'm always happy to do that. But 99% of the time they never reach back out to me. Um, the people who do. I mean, they've asked for the informational interview and they don't complete it or they do it. No, no, no. So, so we'll have, we do have the interview okay. but then afterwards. Um, you know, they might say, say a thank you or something, but I most of the time never hear ever again. Um, and I know for me, when I was first asking for informational interviews, I, I was like, well, I don't want to bother you with my petty life. Like, you probably don't care. I'm very boring. <laughs> but the truth is, like, I really, really do care. And if you and for the people who do stay in touch with me, like I am now, um, like we like I share. I share things with them that makes me think of questions they've asked or, you know, things that they might be interested in. And they, right. it's kind of like a two way street. So 
yeah. I, well, the, this this is my time to then once again recommend the book by Karen Wickery, which I mentioned early, early on. And I don't know if you know this book and you obviously have uh, uh, embraced all the practices she talks about. Her last name is W-I-C-K-R-E. And somebody's going to look up that book for me. Uh, and it's about networking. Oh, okay. Karen. Nice. And she's she calls herself an introvert. So she says, this, not, this is not easy for me to reach out like this. But when I think of individual people who I want to learn something from or who I want to pass something to, I can do that because that's a one-on-one -on -one relationship and we're having that conversation, you know, asynchronously or whatever. And, uh, and the other part is she talks about, and I think you're saying the same thing, this business of staying in touch. So you can always write back to somebody and it doesn't have to be, I found my perfect job. Thanks so much for giving me that informational interview. All you have to write back is say, I saw this article and it made me think of our conversation. Exactly. That's enough. It's, it's a way of keeping that conversation going over the slow, long term and keeping yourself top of mind for somebody who may find out who she's in the network. She knows where all the jobs are. Thank you, Marcus. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and Alex, I also like completely agree with this people do want to know how their info helped you um and nancy i like that you brought up how she's an introvert because i am also an introvert and when i was asking people for informational interviews that first summer after college it was like just so much anxiety like i can't even painful. Like, yeah. it was just painful and yeah and i still don't like asking people for informational interviews but because i truly am like a hardcore introvert but I've just like, I've realized that I have no choice in, in life. Like if I, if I wanna like continue being able to do stuff that I really like and also um, helping people and having people help me, like as linguists, we know that conversation is how things get done. And so as an introvert, I'm like, well, I'll embrace the conversation even if it, even if it's sometimes painful. <laughs> and without uh, quoting Margaret Mead, let's just say small groups are very effective, mm. right? So you can have a small group, which is two or three or four people. It can make a fabulous product. Let's talk Yahoo. Let's talk Google. And you said something else that I want to underscore, which is you took a job at a small organization and it gave you this huge learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. You happen to have a boss who was good at feeding you things in the right timing and scaffolding your development. But mm -hmm. I think that in general, or and I think in general, a small organization is often the place you can do that more easily. Absolutely. So. Like, and I also want to call this out because I've been encouraging my sister to start finding startups versus like these giant corporations that are listing jobs on LinkedIn. Um, because she was like, I don't want to work in a startup. They kind of like scare me. Like it scares me to think that I could be in such an unstructured environment. So I, I don't know, like I, I didn't know that she felt like this. Maybe other people feel like this too, but mm -hmm. I want to call it out because it's not really like that. Like it's, it's not scary in that way. It's, it's more exciting, especially if you are looking for a learning opportunities like you just met like you just mentioned nancy and and b like responsibility because responsibility is really hard to <laughs> attain um in the working world and a startup is a really amazing way to um to find it like right off the bat and and show that you can get things done and that you yeah Right, right. And so you and you recognize that there's a gap here and nobody's filling it. So you're going to make an effort to do it and somebody else can clean it up as soon as you've done the first draft, because you really don't know what the whole scope of this thing is. But exactly. there is this gap. So let's put something out there that's going to fill that gap. Right. And that's that gets me to another uh, kind of startup -y attitude thing, which is anything worth doing is worth doing half ass. <laughs> right. I'm sure you've heard something like that. Which oh, yeah. I, I had a hard time with as a motto in my, you know, in, in general, I don't think of that as the way I do business, right? Except when you understand, you know, then you have to decide, is the thing I'm trying to clean up and make beautiful or accurate, is that really a stopper 
for the whole product getting out? Or should we be, our organization, be first to market with this magical new cerebral login thing that I can just attach right back here and it's going to get me to the website I'm thinking of immediately, right? Or the app and or the Wikipedia page. God, I like that one. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you're going to be first to market, get that jacked in thing to market right away. Mm -hmm. And don't worry if the documentation has a few things that need updating because the last version we eliminated that whole feature and you know because we replaced it with this magical thing so yeah right so that you know there i think i said three things in one there but you get the yeah idea. well i think you you hit on kind of just the startup vibe like which is we move really fast and you have the opportunity to do a lot and and that you know you're that's great in, in and of itself but for when you're looking for your next role that will also give you a ton of a ton to talk about and kind of show that you've already achieved and um and, and you're a self-starter that's another thing that yeah. you can demonstrate through that yep. you know nobody was doing x i took it on myself i let my manager know i was going to do it and they agreed and so uh yep. you know we just went ahead and and obviously this turned out to be a really important thing because in the same moment as we released salesforce came out with this thing that was sort of comparable but ours was a little simpler because we didn't have so many people working on it right yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so you can iterate faster and, and we can iterate faster right right now at the same time as we're talking about startups and startup culture and all that uh i also want to put put out the reminder that i mentioned which is for people who are not u.s citizens or green card holders it may be tougher to get a um a job at a startup because they are not going to know how to sponsor you for yeah, a work okay. visa and they don't have the bandwidth to hire somebody who knows how to do that so that's a disadvantage of startups for some of our audience absolutely yeah good call okay uh, what kind of a career ladder do you see in VUI for people? Um, so I would say an entry level VUI designer, the, the salary for that is around 60 to 75K. Mm -hmm. From there, you would go to kind of like a mid level designer. Um, and then senior designers can make upwards of 120K. Um, and, and so that's just like kind of the straightforward, just buoy ladder. Um, but for me, like what happened to me was my first boss came from a product role at Amazon. He was, he's first and foremost, a product person, not a designer. And so product people and designers work together to um, sort of realize the whole vision. Um, I like to think of the product person as what are we designing? And then the designer as how is it going to be experienced? So you might have Amazon's mobile app and you decide, okay, on this app, you're going to be able to buy stuff and return stuff, but we're not going to let you track packages yet. That's out of scope, we're not gonna have that feature included. But the designer is who is the person that actually makes those features happen and, and makes it so that either it is really, really easy to be able to buy stuff or it's like kind of a pain to be able to buy stuff. Um, so these two people work hand in hand um, to take that analogy to like a VUI uh, setting, a VUI product manager would be someone who says, okay, we're gonna let people ask Alexa to um, turn the lights on and to set a timer. But for now, we're not gonna actually let them, um, what, set an alarm. And Play music, whatever it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, play music, that's a better one. Um, but the the VUI designer is the one who decides, okay, how many different, ex how many, turns conversational turns is it going to take for somebody to actually achieve this playing music feature um so it's very like close relationship and for me i started as a designer and realized that product 
is actually something I love too. So that's why I'm doing product now. Um, and when you kind of get, when you kind of break into the design world, there's so many different paths that you can take from there. You can go into product, you can go into UX research, you can go into development if that's what you like. There, mm -hmm. There's all these adjacent roles on any given product team that are all super interesting too. Um, so the latter is not just like a one lane thing. It, you can go like so many different ways. Good, good. Okay, so this is, we're not talking about a ladder. We're talking about kind of a jungle gym or something mm -hmm. like that. <laughs> exactly <laughs> okay good so uh that made me think of two things when you were talking uh let me see if i can draw up either one of them i'm going to go back to my list and i'm going to come back to that then so um how do you feel that uh COVID has affected your work life or the uh, other organizations that you're in touch with your clients uh that's a good question i would say Looking back, companies are investing more in voice now. Mm. COVID did not slow that down. It might have sped it up. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, like I would say for any kind of conversation design role, you COVID didn't impact it at all. And if it did, it was in a positive way because ultimately um, businesses are really investing in a lot of like alternative ways of communicating with their customers and mm -hmm. that includes voice and chatbots so um the conversational industry at large is growing very 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 quickly and it's not going to slow down okay i'm going to throw in two questions here one is uh okay i got I, i've retrieved some of those things that i was thinking about you also have taken on a big role in women in voice. So how has that um, contributed to or uh, enhanced your uh, career in voice? And what's, what's it given you and what's, what kind of things do you have to give it? Um, so I would say that getting involved with any organization like that whether it's kind of like a local chapter of a voice UX meetup, or maybe it's women in voice, or maybe it's, you know, any other, like a Google, Google developers, uh, experts program, like all of those are just great ways to connect with more people, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And like, that's, that's really like why I'm still a part of it. Um, along with just the learnings and kind of the, the events that go on. Um, but yeah, like. Yeah, I mean, that's how I think of my involvement with Beikai is very much a continuing education mm -hmm. program that for a long time I was the recipient of and now I'm the mm -hmm. offering person for mm -hmm. uh, at yeah. least part of the time. Yeah, and that's what's so cool about voice is that a, the community is really small yet. So it's just like really just get in now and like find people and make friends. Most people want to be your friend. Um, most people are very supportive. And the other thing is that, okay, I just adore this about tech in general, but especially with voice, there are no right answers right now. And I struggled my whole career I, my whole educational career with like testing and math and chemistry and it was always just like this upward battle of uphill battle of like not being able to get those A's on those tests because I my brain didn't really think like that but I was so good at so many other things but the way that the school system is set up it, you don't really like get to shine in those other ways as much as you would if you were just naturally good at like chemistry or math. Um, mm -hmm. So in tech, it's just like the total opposite side of the spectrum. It's whoever is has really good ideas and wants to put them out in the world and wants to contribute um, and wants to become a part of Women in Voice or these other groups and just put themselves out there like no one has the right answers because tech is literally like 25 years old. And like 
so everybody knows that we're all just kind of like bullshitting and like figuring out as we go. And if you have cool ideas, people will listen to you and you don't need a master's degree or a PhD to be listened to. If you have those, um, that's great too, because you kind of have like a really deep perspective on something really specific that you can then, you know, apply to whatever your role is there. But if you don't, it's just about like what you're doing and it's not about what you've done. So that's something that I just like personally, I, I don't think I would want to leave tech because I know that, for example, my roommates who work on the Hill for congressmen and stuff, it's very, very much like the opposite. It's more about like, what are your credentials? And tech is just not like that at all. I want to pull up the comment from the chat which just got answered and see if you have additional answers for that. Oh, yeah. And Wendy asked, is women in voice open to members who don't currently have a job in VUI? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Anyone who's interested in VUI, you can join. Same is true for all these other affiliative groups that we keep talking about. Nobody's going to ask for your license at the door. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Definitely. Expressing an interest and and asking what VUI stands for is still fine as a way of getting in. Then people get to tell you all about what they've been doing mm -hmm. and you get to ask more questions, all the better. Yes. Yeah. I mean, even at these larger tech companies, like I have a bunch of friends at fang companies like Facebook, Amazon, Google, and the stories that I hear them tell, it's it's really just like nobody knows what's going on. It's more just about like, what can we test out? Like tech is just such a crazy industry for that reason. It's all about like, it's not like you're, there's nothing really at stake, right? Like if you're, if you are a doctor, like there's a lot at stake, you need to have those credentials in place. But with, with tech, we're like, we're launching a thing that can talk to people. Like, let's just try random stuff out and see what happens. So Right. And that, there is other kinds of tech which where you better have uh, somebody checking your work a lot, you know, oh, yeah. because it's Absolutely. controlling medical devices or the power yeah. plants or whatever it is. And so you want to have uh, non-fatal errors happening less, you know, definitely. less and less. And um, there are definitely serious sides of design, too, where sure. you don't want to be, you know, you, you do want to be ethical and mindful of various different things. But in general, it's kind of an open box. So we're still like defining those rules and we're figuring out what is ethical. So there's just so much room to contribute there, which I think is really cool. Good, good, good. Um, there was a question here about whether a product manager, and that's probably different from product designer, but you can take both, both points of view. Um, does that require a business degree? Is Absolutely that not. <laughs> Okay. No, absolutely not. But I could absolutely see why you would think that. Um, so a product manager, the product manager role is also just kind of new. It's, it really became mainstream maybe 10 years ago. So, um, so product managers, like, I was talking to someone the other day who used to be like director of product at Chase, I think it was. And she has also worked kind of in um, really, really like high level roles in various product roles at all kinds of different companies. Mm -hmm. She was telling me that when she, she, she's been talking to a few like recent grads recent, uh, recently that told her like, I did a, pro a, pro a product manager um, focus in, in their uh, degree. And she was like, how like how is it even possible to teach product because it really is kind of a you really learn on the job um, and there are a lot of different things that you can do to set yourself up to become hireable as a product manager but there's literally no way to train to to become a product manager except to be one and it, it's kind of like trying to train for being a ceo like nothing on earth is going to teach you how to be a good CEO other than being a good, other than being a CEO. So you mean reading that tall list of, of business books on my bedside <laughs> is going to make me a great CEO? Unfortunately not. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I wish it could, but, but yeah, product is another really cool career path that um, I would be happy to talk to anyone about. Um, 
And and I think product in because when we talk about it often, it, it has both the it's in the same way that at the university there's a dean and there's a provost, right? So one of them looks inward and one of them looks outward. Um, I think in product, there are people like that too. And so you aren't doing all of it yourself. If you're the product manager or the product, even yeah. the product designer, you're probably relying on your UX team to give you some designs and get, ask, get some research for you. The marketing people have other research that they're gonna give you. The forecasting people are looking at other industries around to see how that's gonna affect their yeah. buying habits they are gonna affect your product success and the finance people have other kinds of pressures to put on you. So there's a lot of input that you're getting both from internal to the company, the marketplace in the whole world, and yeah. then how your brand and product are perceived and whether the market's ready for you to jump into voice. And of Absolutely. course at this point, everybody's ready for everything to jump into voice. So let me yes. ask the hard question. Well, see if you have any response to that. And then I have another question. Well, I did also want to say as linguists, I think we're also really like we're cut out to be a great product manager too, because product management is all about influencing without authority. And the way that you do that well is through very particular types of communication and advocating and being able to rally people. So <clears throat> knowing what we know about how language can be used as a tool um, can be very, very useful in the role of a product manager who is really kind of this conductor or like they're kind of orchestrating an entire thing. They're bringing a lot of different people together and they're kind of the core. And then they're also like influencing things and making things happen, which is fun. <laughs> all right, we're gonna get on, I'm gonna change the topic again and that, but it's still related to all this stuff. Talk to me about accessibility in voice. Um, so to me, voice is one of the last pieces of the accessibility puzzle, if that kind of makes sense. And I would love to know what your thoughts on that too are, Nancy. But I mean, if you think about it, the way that we communicate with computers and talk to computers uh, has always been like seeing something and um, you know, typing some input or maybe tapping it. And then now we have, you know, you can listen to audio on, on your screen, um, but you still can't really talk to your computer to make stuff happen. So there's all these different modes of like input and output when you're talking to any computer or trying to get information. And with voice in and audio out as kind of being much more mainstream and probably also on the verge of being used in just your typical like browser experience like you can kind of picture instead of on the google home page well actually this already exists if you go to google there's like a little speaker where you can speak into it so like i don't know i like to think of it as this spectrum of ways that you can um, give information and get information and depending on who your audience is you want to be leveraging a variety of different ways to give info or get info and that might be voice or it may be um it may be typing or it may be reading or it may be listening and and when we kind of think holistically about all these different modes of input and output then we are making things as maximum maximally accessible as we possibly can so uh, yeah, I mean, the first interface for the computer was the card deck, right? Mm. <laughs> Which wasn't, or the tape, the tape True. roll. True. Neither of those are particularly accessible to humans. No. Right? <laughs> and, and not very efficient or, and it, we didn't have a lot of memory to tax either. So, you know, there wasn't much space for her storing anything. Yeah. But I agree with you that I think that uh, voice opens up a lot of opportunities for people at various levels of literacy. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, voice is a great opener. And on the other hand, everybody with uh, speech differences, whether yeah. it's intelligible to you and me or not, and it may be as easy as a foreign accent, or it may be something like deaf speech or arthritic speech or something like that, which is not necessarily as intelligible. And so then can the machine understand better than the person? um mm -hmm. that that's an interesting case too 
Absolutely. And I've been watching our captioning and noticing how well, I mean, I'm surprised how well it handles accented English. And we've got plenty of examples in our group of strongly accented English. And the, yeah. the captions have been not perfect, but, you know, pretty darn good given the history of bad captioning. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, and then, of course, so uh, if you if you can speak to the machine, but if you can't hear the response from the machine or understand the response, then that's tricky too. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, it's a wonderful set of dilemmas to have with an almost robust set of technologies. I mean, yeah. getting more and more robust. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And there's, a, there's an interesting model that I've been using a lot more lately, which is called the social model of disability, okay. which breaks it, breaks disability into three distinct categories. So first is permanent disabilities. Um, for example, uh, Alzheimer's um, or uh, like motor uh, impairments. Or how about trifocals? <laughs> I mean, I'm not disabled, but I do wear trifocals, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, no, that's a great one. Um, and then there's, uh, okay, permanent. Permanent, and there's the, then the temporary, like the broken arm. Yeah, there's temporary, like broken arm or um, having laryngitis. Right. Can't really speak to Alexa. And then there's situational, where if you're walking into your house with bags of groceries, it's going to be a lot harder for you to text your sister back than if you just spoke your spoke your text and sent it off, right? So again- and then there's a time when I have that cup of hot coffee and- Mm. I, can't. <laughs> yes. I can't talk exactly so so yeah I think again like thinking about all these different modes of input and output also I think that situational um, or the social mode of disability can also be really helpful when you're thinking about like when would something be best leveraged yeah it's it's an interesting dilemma and it's worth us thinking about each time with each new product and each instance of a product because yeah. Who are you excluding just by the modality? Mm -hmm. And then how do you compensate for that? Or how do you, uh, you know, regulate for that within mm -hmm. your own product line? Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you alert the engineering staff? This has got to be built in the following way. Yeah. Because we are uh, disabling people, right? Disability is the, the somebody's, life circumstances, whatever it is, permanent, situational, uh, and the built environment having incompatibilities where there's no way to get them together. Right, right. Yeah. And, and even just for, for um, like the, the general population, we all have kind of biological uh, constraints where we can, for example, we can read and scan something way, way faster than we can listen to something being spoken to us. So, you know, that's kind of an, an accessibility consideration as well, but it applies to all of us just in the, in the general population. Same thing goes for um, speaking. We can speak much faster than we can type. So again, it's kind of like this puzzle of like, how do we want to arrange the mm -hmm. input and output? Mm -hmm. So what kinds of testing do you get involved in with the products that you're designing? Or what kinds of testing happens, whether it's you that does it or somebody else? Um, I would say on a team that, so as our product leader, um, I'm also kind of like our only researcher, our only tester. So, uh -huh. um, so I kind of like, make do with what we have which is really customer interviews are like crucial like for example if if someone from my team has an idea like okay let's add this into the product maybe this is a good idea as product manager my number one job is to say like okay cool idea should we a should we even do this b should we prioritize this if the answer is yes we should do this and and it's so tempting as humans to kind of put ourselves into the shoes of our users and say like, absolutely, that's a great idea. I would love to have this in that product, so uh -huh. let's do it. But 
but it's like, for me, it was just so important to break that habit and always say like, I could be completely wrong in every scenario. So I'm going to go ahead and ask at least three people that are, you know, our customers, obviously that's not a great sample size, but when you're very limited on time and resources to do any testing, it's at least something to where we can kind of get a read on the situation. And, and that will, you know, if three different customers are telling us, oh yeah, like we've wanted that for a while, it gives us more to go off of than, um, than just being like, oh, I think this is a great idea. So interviews are crucial. And then we're kind of building out a more robust testing process for when we're actually um, like beta testing and a new feature. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, like the teams that use our product also do a lot of testing and that like you really cannot launch a conversational system without doing testing because fundamentally the system isn't going to know what to do unless it has data already kind of being fed into it. Um, so what so, kind yeah. of testing do they do? I understand you do these semi-structured interviews or you show them something and so on. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to put the Nielsen Norman article about how many uh, oh, nice. users, because that's actually the statistical justification for five users. Oh, okay, okay. nice. And, and there is a, an experimental design that uses chi-squared as its statistics. And therefore you can, you can have some level of confidence if all five of your users come from some same sameness, right? Mm-hmm. And you don't want to have one user who's a end user and one user who's a, C, a B2C user and, you know, from different kinds of marketplaces. But if they're all generally from the same group, then five users is enough to test a feature or a small number of Oh, features. that's interesting. Okay. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And that's why I've been reading this, this uh, website, the Nielsen Norman group website, before it was Nielsen Norman, it was just Jacob Nielsen in the beginning. Oh, wow. And, and uh, he put out something uh, called alert box uh, every week or two weeks. And he, uh, and he was the first avoider of graphics. And he talked about why it was an all text thing. He's since then gone on and, you know, this is 20 years later and, or more. Mm-hmm. 30 years, I think he's been doing this. So uh-huh. you can understand why 30 years ago, he was not real fond of graphics. They were heavyweight, hard yeah. to load, and mostly being used for decorative things. Now graphics have lots of shared meanings among the users and so on. Anyway, but you're, you're fine with only three because you know your product and getting three voices is pretty darn good. So when your other teams, you said, are doing their testing as well, what mm-hmm. kinds of testing are they doing and how is it different from what you're doing when you're interviewing three customers? Yeah, so the teams that are using our tool, like our customers, they are building conversations and they will actually use kind of our built-in testing feature to mm. send a link out to someone. So mm. if I was creating a voice experience and I needed to know <clears throat> if it was intuitive or if it was confusing people in certain areas, um, <clears throat> I could send a link to you, Nancy, and then you could actually like interact with it whether you type or you speak to it um however they wanted to set it up and then they like that team then back in their their own portal they'd Mm -hmm. be able to see okay nancy kind of went on this little detour it looks like she got confused here but she got back to the happy path and then she actually achieved the goal so this is like kind of how i'm seeing teams actually test Mm -hmm. their own conversational experiences, um, along with, you know, gathering as much data about how Nancy is going to ask to, um, to track her package. There's so many different ways people can ask that. And your model is going to break if you don't have much variation of what to account for, Mm. what to expect when people ask your model that. So, um, so with, with conversation, it's, way way more important to do a lot of testing because um because like fundamentally the system can't really function without that Mm -hmm. that's a great example i i hadn't thought about it quite that hard and that linguists are so good at paraphrase Mm -hmm. and uh so this is the place where that kind of ability is definitely going to be needed oh yeah absolutely and, and as linguists, we know how to come up with a lot of different ways someone could possibly ask for something. 
but again it's always important to break out of that and acknowledge like we can't we can't possibly think of every way someone could ask for something so we're gonna we're gonna rely on the testing data yeah good good I feel like moira has a question really quick good okay best way Please. to get internship with a startup um is to find the startup first and then email someone um so let's see i would recommend like actually discovered a trick recently okay there's, there's a website called crunchbase i don't know if anyone's familiar with that but it is basically it's for like investors and and founders mostly uh, it's like a an investment website, but the reason it's important is because basically every company under the sun that's ever received funding from an investor is on there. And when a company, and it will list based on like, okay, it got seed funding, which is like its first round of funding from investors, or it got series A funding, which is the second one and so on. Um, you get an, an idea of how big the company is. Um, and if they just received funding, they're definitely hiring. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of backtrack by using Crunchbase to find companies that interest you and then using kind of like what you know about what their funding level is uh, and when it was funded to say like, okay, maybe this is a good place to work at, maybe they're hiring. And then always make sure to uh, first try to find a real person like whether it's on linkedin it could be a recruiter or maybe it's just the founder if it's a really small company um and then like try to find an email if at all possible if not find them on twitter or linkedin that's where most people will be living and then if that doesn't work submit your um, application but also just be persistent because things just get lost in people's inboxes and it's not it's not annoying when people follow up. It's actually really helpful. Um, and then if that doesn't work, just find a different person at the company. <laughs> and if that doesn't work, then give up because there are a lot of other companies out there that you could work for. Great. I love that advice. Somebody asked, Janice wants to know what we can learn in school to prepare to work in VUI. Um, that's a really good question. Um, if your school offers any classes in UX um, or design, that would be kind of like the first thing I would recommend because ultimately WUI design is a subfield of UX design. Um, and then otherwise a conversation analysis class would be really good, discourse analysis, um, drama classes because when you are you know when you're acting you're you're performing dialogue and dialogue is what we are creating and designing when we are conversation designers mm -hmm. um what else creative writing would be really good um i took this class called ubicomp as in like ubiquitous computing um that really kind of opened my eyes to the world of tech but but yeah i don't know Ubicomp was the term found, formed, oh God, and my poor spell check doesn't know it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, by The term was found, sorry, term was created by a guy named Mark Weiser, who was at Xerox Park for many years. And he used to say the difference between virtual reality and Ubicomp is, Ubicomp is upwardly compatible with reality. <laughs> I thought that was a funny thing to say. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, Ubicomp is a fun field. It's also a fun community if you get involved with the conference and stuff. Yeah, fun people in there, good imaginations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think we're hearing two things from you. One is, yes, there's lots of things you can learn in school that will be helpful to you in developing a VUI career. And two, there are lots of things outside of school that you can learn from peers in the field right now and peers in adjacent fields and so yes. don't count on school being the only place you're going to learn this stuff yes don't and um you can do all this yourself like you there all the tools are out there to create your own portfolio to design a project um that's really what we did in my course was 
we I came up with a fake company with a fake goal mm -hmm. and and a fake customer base. I made up some data about them, and then we really just um, designed a voice experience from the ground up for them. And my students today and on Thursday are going to take everything we've learned and kind of package it up into a portfolio. Um, so none of this was like part of school. Like I really just thought of all of this with my imagination and you can do the same. You can also, right. you, so there's something called so the, the things that you did, like creating the company, creating a customer base and creating some data about it really were a way to put constraints around what kind of a product you could create for exactly. that audience and that product space. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. So that you don't have to think about everything in the whole world. And that's very confusing and too much to, this is a, a filter that you've given them to be able to constrain some of the parameters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and Miriam, I think you and I were at the same UBECOM conference because I was also in Hawaii. So that's cool. Um, there's something called a, wait, were you talking, Miriam? I, I just said fabulous because oh, I, yeah. I learned a ton about the kind of work that people in that area uh, do. I learned about the research. I learned about the cool things that people were designing. Um, and I was at a resort hotel in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> So what's what's bad there? Nothing. It was beautiful. <laughs> and, you know, I even uh, still have a couple of the lunch bags. I use them all the time. I think I do too. <laughs> They're great. Good swag, huh? Good swag. Yeah. Good. Fabulous swag. We got lunch in the uh, sustainable bag. So all yeah. right. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, yeah. Very last thing on the topic of jobs and internships. Um, and, and what you can do outside of school. I learned recently about something called a value validation project. Mm. Which I'm gonna link to right here, including mm -hmm. an article that really walks you exactly through how to do a value validation project. And the whole like idea behind it is that, you know, any hiring manager, any team gets so many different, well, gets way, way more applications to a role than they could ever hire into it. So if you, so obviously like everyone always says you need to stand out, but how do you do that with a resume and with a portfolio? A value validation project is like, I think the most cut and dry way that you can do this. Um, and it really is just about like showing what you know and the how, how you're willing to kind of showcase um, and put in effort and time to show them that versus just, you know, the fact that you maybe submitted the same cover letter to 15 different companies. Good. Thank you for that hint. And we'll, we'll definitely look that up. That looks like fun. Okay. Now I think we can say thank you very much. And I really appreciated this. Let me, uh, one thing I was thinking about while we were talking <clears throat> was if Greg were here, I think he might have chimed in with there are things that you know in linguistics that people in engineering have never thought about mm -hmm. and are useful for you to communicate with them. For example, if you look at his LinkedIn and go back a year or two, he gives a talk where there are 10 things about conversation that you need to know to be a good conversation designer. Things that are so obvious to us, you don't think you have to tell people, but you do. Yeah. A conversation has an opening, a conversation has a closing, the people uh, greet one another and say their names or identify themselves. So your bot should say, I'm a bot. You can call me Harry or whatever, but I'm a bot. And then this business of uh, bots have now gotten smarter so that you don't actually, if I tell you something in theory, you should remember it, you bot should remember it and be able to follow on from that and not ask that same question a different way, stuff like that. And so Greg had these like 10 little items that seem to a linguist like, uh, this is totally pro forma, everybody knows this. Mm -hmm. It's true, everybody knows it, but not at the level of being able to say it. And yeah. not at the be level of being able to specify it as one of 10 keys. And of course, a nice number for a listicle is 10. Uh, so I'm sure he did a little bit of squeezing to make them all fit into that 10 model. But 
I, I thought that was a very clever thing to do. And it certainly got him a lot of attention, both inside the company and outside the company, to be able to take something like that, what we think of as common knowledge, and it is sort of common knowledge, but giving some very specific guides to this is what you know, this is what people assume, this is what people don't want to see, all combined into that little list was very helpful. Real, this is great. And congratulations on the course. And thank you so much for spending this hour plus with us. And uh, good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. I'm happy to Thanks spend time with you. All of these amazing sessions. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.